Well, welcome to this talk. My name's John Campbell, and I'm going to be talking you through some of the prefixes we use in medical terminology in this presentation. Now, the prefix comes in front of a word and gives us information about the word that's going to come. So whenever we see a on front of a word, that means without. So apnea, achlorhydria, a tony, all mean without the word that is to come. Now what I've done in these presentations is I've made the prefix in red. So we see the word there is apnea, apnea, pronounced apnea. And in the States you wouldn't include the O in the word. So pnea means breath or air. So apnea means without breath or air, a apnea pronounced apnea. So someone who is apneic is not breathing. Now the chlorhydria refers to the hydrochloric acid in the stomach. So achlorhydria would be a condition where there is no hydrochloric acid in the stomach. In practice it would mean there is less hydrochloric acid in the stomach than normal. Atony. Now the tony part there, or the tenny part, T-O-N-Y, that refers to the tone of a muscle. So atony is a condition where the muscle has lost its tone, the muscle has lost its strength. So for example in the post-operative situation there could be a gastrointestinal atony and if that's bad it could be a paralytic ileus where the bowel isn't working at all for a period of time. Or there could be a uterine uh, atony, that's loss of tone in the uterine musculature after childbirth. No, normally, of course, it's the contraction of the uterine muscle which compresses the vessels and reduces the blood flow. So if there's uterine atony after muscle after childbirth, then there can be more bleeding because the bleeding vessels are not clamped down on it lacks the direct pressure. So a in front of a word simply means without the bit of the word which is then to come. Now, an, a-n in front of a word as a prefix, also means without. So a or an in front of a word actually mean the same thing. So anaerobic. Anaerobic metabolism, for example, is metabolism that takes place in the absence of oxygen, giving rise to the production of lactic acid. So anaerobic means without oxygen. Or we may have anaerobic organisms in a wound, causing wound infection. Anaerobic organisms being organisms which thrive in an ox in an oxygen depleted atmosphere. Or anemic. Now, emic, a e m i c, is to do with the blood. So, if someone is anemic, they have no blood. They are anemic. In practice, of course, it doesn't mean they have no blood at all. It means they have lowered concentrations of haemoglobin in their blood. And there is therefore a reduced oxygen carrying capacity of that blood. But technically, anemia means without blood. So there's reduced amounts of blood. Now, if you go to the dentist to get your tooth out, you'd be very grateful for a, uh, an anaesthetic. An anaesthesia, an, without, anaesthesia means feeling. So anaesthesia literally means without feeling, which of course is very desirable if a doctor or a dentist is inflicting something painful on us. So anaesthesia literally without feeling. So remember the prefix a or an always means without. Now anti a-N-T-I means against or opposed to. So an antibiotic is against biological life, literally, against biotic life. And specifically, this is to do with bacteria. So an antibiotic will kill bacteria. That is what it is against. Antiperistalsis. Now, peristalsis, for example, in the gastrointestinal tract, will propel things from the direction of the mouth to the direction of the anus. 
So normally when we swallow this peristaltic, waves are going from the mouth down the esophagus towards the stomach. But if there's antiperistalsis, that will be going in the opposite direction, as might occur in vomiting, where there is regurgitation against the normal physiological direction. So that would be antiperistalsis. An anti-inflammatory drug is going to act against inflammation. So, for example, steroid drugs such as hydrocortisone are going to be highly anti-inflammatory. They will act against, they will inhibit the anti-inflammatory response. Or we have a group of drugs called non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which are anti-inflammatory drugs, but which are not steroids, such as ibuprofen or indomethacin or aspirin. So they're anti-inflammatory because they're acting against the inflammatory response. Now, anti with an E, A-N-T-E, means before something, before in time. So, for example, antenatal, natal refers to birth. So antenatal would be care or a period of time before birth. So the antenatal period would be before the birth occurs. Antenatal care would be any care that occurs, really from the time of conception, right up until the time of birth. It is before the time of birth, so it's antenatal. Brady in front of a word always means slow. Bradypnea would be slow breathing. Bradycardia. Cardia is to do with the heart. So a bradycardia is a slow heart rate. Technically, any heart rate below 60 beats per minute, although we'd have to think about that in the context of the patient's physiological norm. But bradycardia, slow heart. Bradykinesia. Kinesia means to do with movement. So if someone has bradykinesia, their movements are slow, as, for example, might occur in Parkinson's disease. Cardia, cardiac, cardio means to do with the heart. So in a cardiac arrest, the heart is arrested and there is essentially no cardiac output. Cardiomegaly. Well, cardio means heart. So can you see there's a heart megaly, cardiomegaly. And megaly means pathologically enlarged or big. So a megastructure is a big structure. A megaly is when the thing being described is enlarged. So a cardiomegaly is an enlarged heart, as may occur, for example, in chronic left ventricular failure. There is an abnormally enlarged heart. Cardiology, or a cardiologist. Cardiology is the study and science of the heart. A cardiologist is someone who studies the heart, usually referring to a doctor who specialises in cardiac diseases. Now, coli means to do with the bile. You might remember that when red blood cells have lived for about 120 days, they're broken down by the macrophages in places such as the spleen. But that bilirubin is released. And the bilirubin travels to the liver and is incorporated into the bile. The bile then goes down the hepatic ducts and is stored in the gallbladder. So coli as a prefix means bile, to do with bile. Now, when I've got a three-part word in this series, I've put the prefix in red and the suffix in blue and the root of the word in black in the middle. So here we have a word, cholecystectomy. So chole is bile, cyst is a fluid-filled space relating to the bladder. So the cholecyst is the gallbladder. An ectomy is a surgical removal of. So chole, bile, cyst, bladder, ectomy removal of, surgical removal of the gallbladder. Cholangitis refers to inflammation of the bile ducts. So coal is bile, itis inflammation of, cholangitis inflammation of the bile ducts. Now most commonly this will be caused by ascending bacterial infection, 
coming up from the duodenum. So for example, if there's a blockage caused by uh, gallstones or a tumour, there can be associated infection of the bile ducts, leading to inflammation of the bile ducts. Or there's another fortunately rare condition called primary sclerosing cholangitis. Sclerosing means hardening of a tissue. And in primary sclerosing cholangitis, it's probably an autoimmune disease. It's certainly idiopathic. We're not quite sure what causes this. But there's inflammation leading to fibrosis, leading to obstruction, over time leading to cirrhosis and uh, liver failure. So it can be quite a chronic condition of uh, this primary cholangitis. Cholecystitis. Cholie bile, cyst, bladder, so that's the gallbladder. Itis is inflammation of. So cholecystitis is inflammation of the gallbladder. For example, there might be a stone obstructing the cystic duct, which is the duct communicating to and from the gallbladder. If that's blocked, the bile won't be able to escape. The bile will be retained in the gallbladder. It will become static. And whenever we have stasis, infection is likely to develop and the infection can cause the inflammation. And in fact, if this is severe, the, there can be pus developing inside the gallbladder. That would be a condition called empyema of the gallbladder. But in cholecystitis caused by infection, there'd be pain in the upper right quadrant of the abdomen. And the patient can be very unwell. They can be fever and even sepsis. Now, col, if it's just C-O-L, as we see in the red prefix here, means to do with the colon. So col for colon, the large intestine. And you probably know this begins down in the lower right portion of the abdomen with the cecum, the appendix, the ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon. On the lower left side of the abdomen, sigmoid colon, rectum and anus, all that large intestine. So colostomy, a colostomy is an opening Ostomy means opening into, a surgical opening. So a colostomy is where the bowel opens normally onto the wall of the abdomen, formed by a surgeon, when usually part of the colon is taken away for malignant reasons, for example, and an opening of the colon is made onto the abdominal wall, colostomy. Colectomy, well, ectomy means removal of, surgical removal of. So a whole colectomy, a complete colectomy might be fairly rare, but you can get various forms of partial colectomy where part of the colon is removed. Colitis is inflammation of the colon. This could be a simple viral or bacterial infection. Or it could be ulcerative colitis, which is an inflammatory disease affecting the colon. Now coliforms... Coliforms are the sort of bacteria that normally live in the colon. So actually when you pass feces, when the, the stool, if the stools are dried, about a third of the dry weight of the stools is actually uh, bacteria. So coliform are the type of bacteria, E. coli for example, that are normally found in the colon. In the colon it's fine, but if they get into other places such as the bladder, they can cause infections such as cystitis if the bladder is infected. So coliforms are the type of bacteria from the colon. Now I wasn't sure whether to include melancholy because it's not really a modern medical term. But melancholy literally means black bile. And, and this goes back to pre-scientific days when people believed in the humours. So if you meet someone and they say, oh, you're in good humour today, that, that goes back to this humoral theory of disease where there were four humours, blood, um, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm were the four humours. Of course, this is all pre-scientific nonsense today, really. But it was believed that low mood and depression was caused by too much black bile. So melan, as in melanocyte, is black, coli, bile black bile 
So um, melancholy, feeling depressed, feeling fed up, having low mood. Um, that's where it derives from, melancholy. The prefix cyst, a cyst is a fluid filled space. And we normally use it as a prefix to mean bladder. So we've already noted that you can have a cholecystitis. Cyst in that case is bladder, but cholei is the gallbladder. But when we use cyst just on its own, we usually mean the urinary bladder. So cystitis is inflammation of the urinary bladder. An ovarian cyst would be a collection or a fluid filled space that occurs in the ovary or it could occur in other places as well, but it just means a fluid filled space. Cystoscopy would be to look into the bladder. Scopy means to look into or to look at. Endo means inside. So endoscopy would be to look in side endoscopy so a colonoscopy looking into the colon a gastroscopy looking into the stomach a cystoscopy looking into the bladder are all forms of endoscopy it is any time we are looking inside endocardium so the endocardium is the inside layer of the heart the outside layer is the pericardium the middle layer is the myocardium and the inner layer of the heart is the endocardium the layer inside the heart lining the chambers of the heart endocarditis would be inflammation of the endocardium the endometrium is the inside layer of the uterus so endo simply means inside enteric comes from the greek word enterokos which means intestine so it means intestinal so enteric fever would be a fever that derives from an intestinal infection. Enteric feeding would be putting food directly into the gastrointestinal tract. So nasogastric tubes, we often call those enteric tubes. In actual fact, the nasogastric, if they're enteric, they go straight into the intestine, but we normally call it enteric feeding. Though having said that, any time you eat normally, that's enteric feeding because it's going into the intestine enteric coated would mean that a medication is covered with a special coating so it's not absorbed in the stomach but goes straight through to the intestine enterovirus would be a virus that infects the intestine gastroenterologist or gastro is stomach and then the uh, entero part would be the intestine so that would be a stomach intestine and an ologist or a logist is an expert. So gastroenterologist is someone who is an expert in the stomach, intestine, yeah, the stomach and the intestine together. They are an expert in those two things. Normally, of course, it means a doctor who studies diseases of the gastrointestinal tract. Now, dys, D-Y-S, is one of the more common prefixes, and it means an abnormal or painful situation so dysuria the prefix is dis the suffix is urea painful passage of urine dysmenorrhea rhea means to flow the m part there the men part is to do with menstruation so dysmenorrhea means painful menstruation pain associated with menstruation often referred to as period pains, will be dysmenorrhea. Dyspnea, the pinea part, is to do with breathing. So dyspnea is difficulty or pain breathing. Normally we use the term dyspnea to indicate abnormal or difficult breathing when the patient finds it difficult to get their breath. Now don't get the next two mixed up. Dysphagia, the phagia part is eating or swallowing. So dysphagia is difficulty swallowing. Dysphasia, the phasia part relates to speech. So dysphasia is difficulty with speech. Both of those, for example, can occur after cerebrovascular accidents. 
gast or gastro refers to the stomach. This is the anatomically precise stomach between the esophagus and the duodenum. So gastritis, inflammation of the stomach. Itis means inflammation of. Gastroscopy, to look into the stomach. Very often with an endoscopic gastroscopy tube. Gastroparesis. Now, paresis means a weakness. And sometimes, for example, in long-term diabetes, there's damage to the nerve supply to the stomach, which means there's a weakness in the stomach and it can't process the food properly. And that can result in vomiting, especially if the patients eat large meals. So gastro prefix, paresis suffix, paresis means weakness. Gly means to do with sugar. As we've said before, the sugar in the blood is glucose. So hypoglycemia, hypo, low, gly, sugar, emia in the blood, low blood sugar levels. Normally before below four millimoles. Glycogen is the storage molecule for glucose in the blood. So when the blood sugar levels rise, insulin is released and insulin has several functions, but one of them is it will convert glucose into glycogen, a polysaccharide insoluble storage molecule, and the glycogen is then stored in the liver and muscles. When the blood sugar levels drop, if people need to increase their blood glucose levels, then the hormone glucagon is released, and that will reconvert the glycogen from the insoluble glycogen form back into the soluble glucose form to restore and maintain homeostatic levels of blood glucose.